a warm welcome to Redford. Qui QCK. And Mr. Trick. And it's an honor to announce the talk, Breaking DRM in Polish Trains, Reverse Engineering a Train to Analyze a Suspicious Malfunction. Hi, I'm Radford. This is Kufri K and Mr. Teak, not Trick. <laughs> And we'll talk today about trains. We'll do a quick intro, tell the story, and then we'll go into technical details. So uh, we sometimes play together STFs with Dragon Sector and Poland can into space. I work for Invisible Things Lab. Uh, I mostly do low-level security and reverse engineering. And, let's, and they, they will introduce themselves in a few slides. Let's start with the story. As you already know, the story is about trains. And the story actually starts a long time ago, in 2016, when Koleje Dolnośląskie, it's a local Polish train operator, bought 11 impulse trains, which one of them is on the photo. Then, after some time, the train started reaching 1 million kilometers on the odometers, and uh, by this uh, amount, you have to do a, uh, a, a big maintenance. And because the manufacturer's warranty already expired, they started a tender to select the best offer for servicing. And the offer was uh, won by SPS. It's an independent train workshop in Poland. And in the first quarter of 2022, the first train reached the workshop. So, let's see at, the, at least the public timeline. The servicing started with uh, the number 24 train. Uh, the workshop took apart the whole train, sent the, the parts to the manufacturers, and then assembled the tra train back. And, but the problem was that the train didn't start afterwards. Then, they took another train for servicing, and it was the same. The trains didn't want to start after servicing. And what's even more interesting is that in the meantime, another workshop started servicing uh, trains for a different train operator, and they ran into exactly the same problem. So it's, it's getting a bit suspicious. Uh, and the story got noticed by media in Poland because you had like less trains running. So the manufacturer issued a public press release and they said that uh, among many other accusations, they said that someone interfered with the security system, whatever that is. And something happened in between and the, the workshop, SPS, started returning the trains, which work. So what happened? And what happened in the meantime? Uh, after the, the workshop got into troubles, the issues didn't look like a normal issues because the, the computer was saying that everything is fine. And they had some uh, pointers into the direction of the manufacturer's involvement. So, but they didn't have any idea what to do. So they Googled Polish hackers and found <laughs> us. <laughs> So we, we got in contact, we got the trains, but that, about that later. Uh, in August, we managed to unlock the first train, and by a few months, la months later, we gathered enough evidence to notice authorities about this. And that's what we will talk about today. 
All right, I think it's my turn. So, uh, hi, I'm Mr. Tick, known in Poland as Pan Klesz, in Germany as Herr Zeke. Ich bin, ein, ich bin ein großer Bahn fan. So, I want to briefly introduce you. Uh, I want to walk you through some initial terms here. So before I tell you how to unlock a train, uh, let's define what a locked train is. So uh, we have basically a train, you enter a cabin, all the system reports that the train is ready to roll. There's this device, combined throttle and brake lever. So you push it forward, the train releases all the brakes, and then it should accelerate, but it doesn't. We have, uh, oh, that's it. Nothing happens. <laughs> you, you, you can see the zero on the screen. So, we had a locked train. The workshop bought additional two CPUs of the uh, same ones that small are installed. Yep, that's one of them. And we got access to all service and maintenance documentation for the trains. And yep, we started. So, uh, a small detour to actually see what a train is. This is a very simplified diagram of uh, how most of modern trains work nowadays. So, at the top we have these three KVDC, that's the Polish uh, current source for trains, this cable that goes above our heads. Uh, the green box is the PLC, the CPU that controls all behavior of the train. Then we have the white or greenish power converter that actually converts this high voltage for all devices and power all smaller devices there. Uh, at the lower part of diagram, we have the stuff that is responsible to slow down the train. So we have compressor that creates a pressurized air. A lot of systems in the train works on a pressurized air, like brakes, for example. More on that later. And in top right corner, we have inverter and a motor. Inverter is used to convert the three kilovolts to a current that motor can accept, accelerate, not burn. And yep, that's the thing that makes a nice sound when you start a train. Everything is interconnected with a CAN bus, about which Q3K tell you more. Okay, I will. Hi, I'm Q3K. You might know me from such shit posts or get, as getting Wayland to run on an iPod Nano, but today I'm not going to talk, to talk about anything about that. Instead, let's talk about CAN. Now, CAN is an automotive protocol, but turns out because the train is made out of multiple cars, that means it also uses CAN. At least that's my understanding. <laughs> In reality, it doesn't even use CAN, it uses a layer on top of that called CAN Open, so we'll kind of look at that layer instead. And CAN Open effectively turns your network of, or, or network of CAN into a distributed mapping of ID into variable data, so different parts of the computer can like read, of the system can read and write some values. And the first thing we effectively analyzed is like, what is the difference on the CAN bus? What's the difference in CAN Open between a train which works and a train which, which doesn't work? also known as, a, known as a trained. And what we found out quite quickly is that the inverter would actually be told uh, slightly different messages from the PLC. Instead of being sent a one, which means uh, please run, please do not run the, the emergency stop, it would be sent a zero, which means do not run. And instead of being sent any power to any of the four inverters, the power would be always set to zero. On the other hand, everything from the throttle lever up to the PLC looked fine, so obviously we needed to look at somewhere in between the PLC and the inverter, because that was the most likely culprit. So this is what we can reduce our problem to. There is a train, it has a CAN network, it's actually a bunch of different buses, it's five of them. There's two PLCs, which are called master and slave, and there's four inverters, so let's just focus on that. And in fact, let's focus on the PLC first, because I keep, we keep talking about CPU, PLC, what is a PLC? A PLC is a programmable logic controller. It's like an Arduino, but bigger. <laughs> What's a TCMS? That a TCMS is the entire system that you get from a vendor if you want to control your train electronically. And in this case, Nevac bought a system from Selectron, which is a Swiss brand, part of a system called Mass M83X, which is based around the CPU 831TG PLC, which I'm just going to call CPU from now on. And in, in, in comparison to an Arduino, it's actually programmed not via C code, but via a weird standard called IEC 61131-3. We'll get back to that later. This is the PLC in its natural habitat. There's the PLC on the right. There is a CAN bus expander to, the, to its left. And finally, to its full left is a power box. Notice that none of these are colored yellow. And this is very important. It means they're not safety critical. So we can't touch them. 
I am not, this is not a joke. The important parts are yellow. So whenever you look at the train, keep that in mind. So how do you actually program one of these? We have the PLC here on the right. We looked into it. It's based around an Infineon TC1130 three core core. It has a bunch of RAM and has a bunch of flash, which I'm sure you know what it is. It has also NVRAM, which is non-volatile RAM, which behaves like RAM but keeps across power cycles. And for programming, there's a software suite from Selectron called CAP1131, where you define your project in the IEC standard that gets code generated into C and that get, gets fed through GCC to actually create a normal binary. And finally, that is uploaded over uh, UDP or RS232. So we know how to upload a program, but how do we actually download it? Because it turns out the software does not have a button that lets you get the software from the, from the PLC for some reason. But we did look, take a look closer at it and we found debugging functionality. And that was basically what, how we ended up acquiring the image from a running PLC. Uh, the debugger is based around a subsystem called Syscom, which is like this unified DLL that is shared across different programs from Selectron, like the IDE called CAP and some extra utilities. We looked at that DLL, we looked at some UDP packet capture, and we found more or less a protocol. And what we found is a, that a, a, when you want to debug a program, you, set, you log into the device via username and password. Thankfully, that cannot be changed. <laughs> at least not in the old software versions from Selectron. Uh, and then you query, like, hey, I would like to get this variable range. Like, I would like to monitor this variable range by address, and I'd like this memory that I've previously requested. And turns out, yes, you just give it an address, so we can just write a real debugger that just asks for all memory range from the beginning to end, and that's how you get an image of your project from a PLC. And now I must apologize, but I'm going to the most boring part of this talk, which is talking about the standard that is used to program these things. Let's start easy. This, uh, this is a sample POU. There's going to be a lot of acronyms. POU is Program Organizational Unit, and this kind of POU is an FB, which is a functional block, function block, which is implemented yes. in ST, which is structured text. It's a mouthful. Don't worry about it. It's going to get worse. Top part are the variable definitions. Bottom part is the actual code. What happens is the code is just executed to every single tick of the system. And we have three variables. We have start, stop, running. These are two inputs, one output, and X state, which is a persistent state. And the code gets executed from the beginning to the end. You if x start is set, x state is set to true. If x stop is set, x state is set to false. And then the output x running is set from x state. So far, so good. Not terrible. Let's look at how it looks like when it's generated to C. This is the structure that gets generated. You can kind of think of it as object orientation, right? Like you have a structure for your FB. And that's fine. Like all the variables we've seen are embedded as parts of a structure. Not bad. This is, the emitted evaluate, this is the emitted evaluation code. So this is the ST code converted into C. You'll see it's pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping, right? So again, the same code. If x start is true, set x state to true. If x state is false, sorry, if x stop is true, set x state to false, and assign the result to x running. Cool. Uh, this is another function that gets emitted. This is called the init function. And that is like in any object orientation as well. It's a constructor for your struct. So that gets called the first time this thing gets initialized. Since everything we start off is false, this is all just zero assignments. OK, not too bad. Now for the it gets worse part. This is another POU. This is a program, which is another kind of POU. It's like an FB, but it's top level. And this one is implemented in a language called FBD, which starts for functional block diagram. And you see this language doesn't text, or at least it's not mostly text. It's actually a graphical language. And what we see here is we embedded our instantiation of the previously defined uh, FB, and we wired some, some other inputs and outputs, so x start, x stop, and x running A and x running B. And these are wired so that effectively our two little motor controllers control two different outputs and are crisscross connected to the start and stop. Let's see how that gets generated. So structure, as expected, the generated structure for the top level program still has the, all the variables we defined. It's missing x start because we messed up, sorry. Uh, it has two S and it has the two embedded POUs, motor control one, motor control two. But you'll see the type here is unexpected. It's SC inst C. It's not the, you would expect that it might be the, embedded, the, the structure we defined previously, but it's this like weird opaque type, type. Put the pin in that. Let's look at the uh, initialization function. It's more or less what we've seen before. Things just get set to zero. But again, nothing is touching the embedded POUs. So what's up with that? Well, maybe let's look at the body and that will answer our questions. So this is the generated body code from that diagram we saw. And if you look at the two little uh, things in brackets, these are the two evaluations on the, of the subordinate POUs. We set 
the X start of the first motor control to the X start of the top level module, X stop to X stop, and then the first second one they're crisscross. So X start is X stop, X stop is X start, and then for each one of them we evaluate them. And you see the evaluation goes for macro code OF. And actually, if you look a bit higher up, the getting the reference to the struct it goes for macro code OD. So what are these? And this turns out are the worst part of this job because the macro OD and OF are just defined as the references for a global table called OCOPT. So effectively, every time you have one POU accessing another POU, it does so for a global array that is effectively untyped. And sometimes the indices into this array are dynamic. So this successfully breaks any sort of attempt of doing, st doing static analysis the traditional way with traditional tooling. Just for complete completeness, this is an OCOPT we generated. And if you remember in this code sample, we had OF of 12 to get the function uh, to evaluate both motor controls. And here the index number 12 is indeed the SC body function of the motor control. So you can follow that, but it is definitely not pleasant. And the SC and C types within the structures, we, have, we still haven't seen how they're actually set. Turns out there's another global constructor that sets all of them, and we'll just skip that because, again, you're already half falling asleep. So we more or less know how the cogen looks like. We know how the generated C sources look like. Now, uh, Redford is going to talk a bit how this looks like the other way around, starting from binary back to C. So let's look at the same toy project but now looking at something closer to what we'll have from a real train. So the binary. Uh, and it will get much worse because we first has to have to disassemble it or decompile. And we had to use Ghidra because other tools just didn't work well for tree core. And actually Ghidra also didn't work, but that, that we'll discuss in a moment. It's yes, it's going to get worse, much worse. Uh, for the toy example, we had symbols, but of course, for a real binary, we didn't have any symbols. Uh, and let's see. That's the decompiled code for our to toy example. And you can see in the first lines that there are even more casts. And here, it's not that bad because we have symbols. So it means uh, that the compiler knew the types. So it's not that bad, but it's still annoying. And also, you can see that there are some troubles with function pointers. You see this end, uh, f, 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 This shouldn't look like that. So the problems with Ghidra and Tricor. There were a lot of them. For example, Tricor is a bit weird. It has separate registers for data and addresses. And uh, as you can see on this example, they're reflected in the calling convention. If a function has data arguments, they are passed through data registers, and pointers are passed through address registers. And the problem is that Ghidra doesn't implement this. So we had all the arguments order messed up. So we had to script Ghidra to fix that. Then you have bugs in the uh, semantics of tree core instructions. This is an example nor.t had this end one in the wrong place. So Ghidra actually thought that this instruction worked slightly differently than it really did. And we found a, a bunch of bugs like that. So what to do? Uh, we used a lot of scripting because uh, you, you've seen this OCO PT table, which basically er erased types from everything. So yeah a lot of scripting to try to undo the damage. Then some binary analysis. Remember, we have this spare computer. We can upload the code we downloaded from a train and just do some experiments on the desk. For example, we can poke some variables and see what happens. And this is quite quick because we can do it at home. Uh, then another idea is to look at the differences between trains, just div the software. You may ask, how is this po possible? Why aren't they all running the same software? It turns out that, I, we don't know why, but basically all the trains had slightly different software. So we had, I think now we have 26 different versions of the software. For 30 trains. Yes. <laughs> so th that's a lot. And maybe, maybe there's something in interesting in the differences between them. 
And we could also look at the CAN traffic and try to find the corresponding place in the code. And also we had some motivation in the form of a deadline because the workshop called us after some time passed. And hey guys, said no pressure, but like yeah. you have a week. <laughs> <laughs> because it turned out that the train operator, after uh, like running without the trains, I think they, they, they were, six of the trains were locked already and it was problematic for them. So they decided that next week they will cancel the servicing contract and we'll ask the manufacturer to do the servicing because the manufacturer claimed that they can fix that. <laughs> so we had quite a short deadline. And in the end, it turned out that the defink was the, the most fruitful way because it, as we noticed, there are a lot of changes in the code responsible for locking the trains. And we actually found the exact place where there's a logic which blocks the trains on purpose. Uh, it was basically the, 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 the first part we found was operating on values which were almost like a million. So our guess was this looks like, a, like odometer because we knew that the trains were supposed to be serviced at one million. So the values look like odometer readings. Uh, and we, we notice that it does something with the values and then if something is wrong, it swaps one bit in NVRAM. And then we found more bits like that with different conditions, which can switch them. And we did a quick test because it looks interesting. We can do a test on our desk. Let's, oh, and what, one, one very important thing. We noticed that the, those bits differ between locked up and running trains. So th this is a bit suspicious. Let's change the bits to be the same as the, tr the, the trains which are healthy. And we uploaded this to the train controller. And <laughs> okay, but that, that was just a test. We need to actually understand what's happening there before we like uh, allow those trains to run. Like it's all nice to just flip some bits and like confirm it does the thing, but it's slightly weird to just like define with that. We wanted to actually understand <laughs> what's going on. So there are two very important questions. The first question is what are the mechanisms which cause the train to actually not run? And the second question is what triggers them? So let's start with the locking mechanisms. The first mechanism you already seen in the message to uh, power converters. So you've seen those four bytes, each of them corresponds to one power inverter. And it, if the bit uh, here, you can see if... Uh, this is very simplified, like the code, yes. like we wanted to post the code, very we tried simplified. hours to fit the code in the slide, it just doesn't fit. So this is a simplified data flow diagram still treat this with a grain of salt. I actually tried. I gave up at, I don't know, four slides or something like that with code. <laughs> so it's something like that. Uh, you have a bunch of t different checks, which are those triggers we'll talk in a moment. They got ended, and if, if they decide that the train should be disabled, then the throttle is gated through this, and it's always zero if the checks don't pass. And that influences the can open message. Another way, which you also seen in the, th that message, is this bit, which is uh, s usually it's documented as reserved for, but in some documentation we found uh, the description as emergency stop. Uh, so we are not sure how exactly it works, but the locked trains had zero and the working ones had one. And here we can actually show you the code. We had this function which decided whether the train should run or not. And it was basically directly written into this scan message, the result of the check. You can see this, the building of this one byte of the message. You have four, four bits, which is in the message. You see one F, O F. F is those four ones, 
which decide which power inverter should be enabled and which should be disabled. And then you have this magic bit. Which comes from a function FB call, which we called sneaky checks. It's a technical term. <laughs> But that did a lot of the calculations for the like required conditions. Like this gets piped into a whole bunch of other parts in the code, but this is one place where you could show it like almost immediately flow into the, the CAN messages. All right, my turn. So uh, another nice failure how we can lock a train is to tamper with some error stuff. So we have this pantograph. It's this thingy at roof of the train that connects to the uh, wire that basically provides all the electricity that the train needs. But this device is operated on a pressurized air. So if the train is cold and dark, we need to generate some initial air pressure uh, for the pantograph or uh, electricity pickup to go up. Uh, but we can't use the main compressor because it's really a power-hungry device and we have very limited batteries in a train. So there's a secondary compressor uh, installed in the train that can be uh, started in the cold train. Then it generates some small amount of pressure that is just enough to raise the pantograph. Then we have enough electricity to engage the main compressor, pressurize everything else and we even have a brakes then. So, uh, the idea here was to... It would be a real shame if the secondary compressor just stopped working. Yes, so one of the lock mechanisms was to disable secondary compressor, and after a while, if it's disabled and it should be enabled, it's reported as a compressor failure, and we can't start the train. So, another very important question is, how to trigger all these lock mechanisms. So we found a few ways to do that. First, that is one of the most common in the trains we investigated, is what we call lack of movement or idle timer. So uh, I want to mention here that all these trains are suburban kinds of trains, so like S-Ban. Uh, they run for like 20 hours per day to generate uh, any revenue. So there is a check that verifies if a train was running over 60 kilometers per hour for over three minutes. And if this condition is not met, the train would just permanently lock. So yeah, you, you may ask yourself a question when the train doesn't move for 10 days when it should move 20 hours each day. Probably either something is broken and it needs servicing and yep, somebody has to do that servicing or in, it's not used. But this is not really a case, except for few cases. For example, uh, before uh, the trains went to the workshop to get serviced, uh, they were just withdrawn from the service, they waited a few days at the side tracks, and it was enough to trigger the lock. So, Kolei Dolnośląski, the operator, asked manufacturer to fix those trains, and they fixed it by extending the lock mechanism from 10 to 21 days. And they've added a very clever mechanism, geofencing. So the train would only lock if it stays. <laughs> so, uh, you, you can the train would lock only if it stays in this random locations. So let's try to draw these random locations on map. So the first location <laughs> is the main competitor of Nevak, Pesa Bydgoszcz. That's the second biggest manufacturer of trains in Poland and their workshops. That's the third workshop owned by Pesa in Minsk Mazowiecki. That's the SPS workshop that was still in construction when those stuff was implemented. That's, that's, that's called future proof. <laughs> <laughs> That's another competitor, Fablok from very nice sounding uh, city of Chanów. Then that's the SPS we were hired by. But wait, there's the more. And there is the manufacturer workshop in Nowy Sądz, but it has an additional condition which was disabled on all of the trains. So for debugging purposes, they could enable also the geofencing trap at their own workshop to test if it really works. Uh, 
There are also some another additional locking mechanisms that were not present in all the trains. So, for example, we had, uh, um, you saw it in one of the initial pictures, the CAN831, that's the module that extends number of CAN buses. If uh, the serial number of the uh, extension device doesn't match the one that is stored in the CPU, the train will lock itself permanently. There was also a similar change, uh, similar check to check the serial number of uh, WTB, that's the bus that connects multiple trains with each other. Then there was a check if the inverter firmware, inverter's firmware version is correct. That's actually a sane one because we want to uh, have a quite aligned inverter firmware and the main software. There was a hard-coded check for one million kilometers, after which the train will not run. And there were some additional checks for odometer consistency, so uh, values of odometer were uh, compared from a few different devices, and if they were off by more than 100 kilometers, the train would break. Yeah, but one thing to remember here is that, what, as, as we said before, there were many different versions of the software. So it's not like every, every train had all of this. Like every train had a subset of those yeah, checks. And except for the first one, the least ones are way less common. So <laughs> we also had a very nice date check in one of the trains. So that's the train that had these uh, secondary compressor problems. So uh, the train was supposed to be serviced on 21st November of 2022. 2021. So, 2021, yep. So, yep. It, if you sp spend a few seconds staring at this line of code, you'll realize that this doesn't exactly do what they intended, probably, unless they intended yeah. to that, break that, the train repeatedly th from the 21st to the 30th of November yeah. and 21st of to 31st of December. Granted, this was only in one train, but it's still, hmm. Because yeah, all of that, these conditions That's not how you compare dates. I uh, mean, it is, apparently. The good news here is that in year uh, 2100, this lock will not work anymore. For 21 years. For 21 years. <laughs> this is actually one of those examples where we can show you the code because we mean, did manage to fit it on two slides this time, so we can kind of follow along. On the left-hand one, you'll see that we are running the function dfbd to get the current time. We do the comparison as in the previous slide, and we use that to set a set reset latch, which we then save to local storage code is date after. And then in the right-hand hand pane, you'll see there's a a bit more uh, combining of that with other inputs into a trigger log variable. Then this goes through two other set reset latches, and finally that ends up in an NVRAM variable called NVRAM lock enabled. So we can kind of follow it from here to the to this NVRAM lock enabled. Of and course, the names are ours. Yeah, this is all our names. Symbols. And like none of this was uh, had any names. So, and then we keep 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 following, and we go actually to the function that decides to enable the compressor in general, like does the compressor actually need to run? And one of the conditions is that it's not locked in in VRAM. And you can see at right at, yes, the second statement that it actually sets the output line of one of the CAN I.O. extenders. So we can use these free snippets of code to like go from date directly into the line on the CAN I.O. extender. And as you can probably guess, Sprężarka Pomocnicza is secondary com compressor. Yes. <laughs> this is on one train. Yep. That train is now famous because it did indeed break on the 21st of December this year. Yep. <laughs> but it, don't worry, New Year's is going to run just fine. <laughs> what else did we find? There is. A secret key combination you can input in cabin that disables each of these locks. It's Some not actually the Konami code. It's much more boring than that, but you know. Yep, but this one is the famous one. So, At some point, unfortunately, they removed it, so oh well. Then there was this mysterious device that was bridging one of the CAN buses, CAN 3, uh, with uh, passenger information system, which has a direct access to the internet. So in theory, there is a possibility to somehow uh, gather telemetry of the locked values, because we know that this device received uh, some metadata about the locks. Uh, 
In few cases, it was able to, the trains were able to lock by themselves using values received by this device, but uh, analysis of the device itself was not yet performed. That's what basically we're doing now. There's a few other things we discovered because like, as we were interacting with all of these operators, some of the trains ended up going to Nevag and back. So we did the you know, kind of sensible thing of, of com doing comparisons before and after, but also not just, we didn't just get our diffs back from what they changed, but we also got a few gifts for us, including an update to DHMI, which is the software that runs on the cabin, that would display the scary message about intellectual property violations, like as any other system alert, like, oh, you know, your brakes are engaged, oh, you're violated copyright. Uh, I am not gonna bother translating all of this, it's all legal bullshit, but let's actually find out, because maybe there is some, some kind of like hidden legal check behind yeah, because, this. Because it wasn't like showing all the time, something yeah. was triggering yes. this message. Let's Thankfully, see what. the HMI is just Linux plus Qt, so like reverse engineering, it's like just free femtoseconds. So we found out that what actually does supposedly violate Nevax intellectual property laws is stopping the train for 21 days and then getting it to run again. <laughs> now, I am not a lawyer, but I'm not exactly sure about this interpretation. Okay, there's a few, there's two case studies that we still want to show because they were somewhat interesting. One of them is Polregio Kraków, which is a transport company and with their workshop in Sucha Beskitska. Yes, yeah, so, so, uh, quick context. After the train started from, successfully from, the, from our workshop, we got a lot of other companies having troubles asking us to look at their trains. Yeah. So one of them, we, we, we learned about four trains that just wouldn't start, and turns out you could unlock them, but if you power cycled them, they would lock up again. And by our understanding, this was just a programming bug, so because we didn't want to actually modify the code to fix it, like all of the things we did, we never modified any code, uh, we, the, they, the trains just got sent, got, ended up being sent to Nevac, and Nevac fixed them, so of course we looked at the difference, and what they did is they fixed their bug, so they wouldn't lock up again, they extended the deadline to 21 days, just in case, and they unfortunately removed the unlock code in the cabin. Another case study was Polregio Szczecin, where uh, we found that the black box kind of external device that's kind of used as a date and odometer subsystem. A lot of different things. Yes, it's kind of like this external but, subsystem uh, that's just... Orange one. You see it's two. orange one, so it's important, right? <laughs> and it would report that it's currently the year 2037, and as we all know, 13, 15 years is more than 10 days, so the train just locked up. A uh, quick summary of all the trains we had. Like, we t tried so hard to make like a Venn diagram or a table of like all the different lock mechanisms. It, it just didn't work. So here's a quick summary. We analyzed 30 trains, 24 of them had mechanisms. The most popular was the, like the train not running for a few days mechanism that was in nearly all of the ones that had any lock in the first place. The kind of combination, like the kind of registering against a CAN 8310 that was also very common. The more spicy ones were more rare. The, G the GPS geofencing was only two trains. The compressor failure simulation was only one train. And the UDP CAN converter, possibly remote lock, was also one train, but we have a few more interesting leads on that. One more thing. When you, once you build one of these projects on the SDK, with you, the, the CAP1131 software, a local file on your Windows computer gets updated, an INI file, with additional build metadata, like the build time and also the build path. And that then gets embedded in the, in the software that gets uploaded to the PLC. And then if everything goes well, a log entry is created on the PLC when the software is updated. So we can actually look at some of these log entries in those PLCs, and the ones that we can fairly sure that we can trust, we can cross-reference against other documents and other timelines, and we can reconstruct the story of some of these trains. So let's look back at our timeline. In August 2021, the tender was won by SPS, and then in January 1st, 20, uh, Janu sorry, January 24th, the first train was supposed to go to, to SPS for serving. And just three days before that, it got a software update. Another train on the, on the 26th of February was supposed to leave to get to SPS, and just two days before that, it got an update. I'm not implying anything, <laughs> but it's, uh, I would like to take a look at this if I was... Um, Kade. Speaking of suspicious things, let's talk about Nevax's response. Uh, so these are, it's very difficult to kind of understand what they're even trying to say because none of their statements make any sense. So we're kind of trying to piece together an argument from their side just so that we can bring it down ourselves. It's, it's really bad, but this is more or less what they're saying. First of all, the hackers or someone else did it. And we've looked at the code and it's, 
obvious that whoever did it had access to the source code. Like, you would have so many side effects of trying to binary patch. Like, it's obviously integrated into whoever had the source code. And I don't know who has the source code other than Nevak. Maybe someone stole the trains and stole the code from Nevak and changed it and uploaded it just, ah, doesn't make sense. Second point, this is slander and defamation. Truth is, I haven't heard of Nevak before this, so <laughs> why would I do that? Third thing, there's no proof. Have you seen the slides? <laughs> Fourth point, oh, we haven't touched these, this train since 2018. So what, like you can write code ahead of time, what? what? Fifth point, if I'm counting correctly, this is a violation of IP laws. Our lawyer begs to differ, we'll see you in court about that. <laughs> ne next point, the software was interfered with and those trains are now unsafe. We either use the unlock combinations that you left in the code, or when you remove the actual reading of the HMI interface, we just trigger the same functions. We just use your code. If your code is unsafe, I don't think that's our problem, right? <laughs> Next step, they actually came up with a new defense. Like, oh, SPS well, did, didn't have the right documents or the right software to mm, fix these trains. Oh, you didn't have this special servicing software. How did you expect to get them running? Well. When the tender to buy the trains from Nevak to KD was published, was, was uh, won by Nevak, Nevak was supposed to give all the docs required to get the train service. So maybe, yes, maybe Nevak is now saying that they didn't fulfill the part of their procurement. <laughs> and finally, the last point I'd like to make, oh, SPS are incompetent idiots. They just keep breaking the trains and nobody can be trusted. And like, it's a train. Give us the docs and like, the SPS are competent. They're, they're able to fix it. Like, we've seen what they've done. We'll still, we're still waiting for more from Nevak because right now none of the recommendation makes sense. Of course, they don't admit to any of this. Next steps. We were supposed to release a technical report about this. It's much more work than we expected because just collating all the information from different firmware version, kind of having comparison tables between all of them, being able to like talk precisely about the data flow, like getting all the code samples in a row. It's a lot of work. Sorry, we'll try to get this done in, in, in January. Second next step, we haven't been sued yet. Uh, if, <laughs> I, I would like to say hi to all the Nevag lawyers on the room, and you know where to find us if you need us. <laughs> to be a bit more serious, the, we, have re, we have been in touch with the various different uh, governmental agencies about this basically since we learned this. The Polish antitrust office, WOKIK, is aware of this since forever. We've been talking to them. The pub, there's a public prosecutor's office case against Nevak probably right now going on, but we don't have much comms with that. Uh, it's, uh, it's like they only said that they are looking into yes. the case. We're not really kept in the loop, but we did speak to all of them and did, we did present our case. And finally, oh yeah, there's also like a whole bunch of free letter agencies that we are more or less in touch with. And finally, we are likely to speak about this to a political audience at the Polish Parliamentary co uh, Commission. I, f I think that's a talk. Yep. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Wow. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Yo, yo, yo. Yeah, wunder, wunderbar. Uh, I asked my... Ja, haben wir hier irgendwie noch... Ah, da kommt's. Ja, irgendwie so Cheat Codes for Trains. So, what a world. Um, I have heard we have a lot of questions uh, in the room and also from the Internet. We start with the Internet. Okay. Um, the internet wants to know how did the trains that got the new AG software update that inserted the logs, um, how did they get there? Where that, was that done remotely? Oh yeah, uh, that's, that's something we should have spoken about in the presentation. Uh, not, they weren't done remotely. Just to make it clear, we are not aware of any mechanism to, up, to update the train remotely. All the updates were performed by Nevag, Nevag service people yeah. or at Nevag's service workshop. Yeah, so like, w when we said we compared the software, it was like the operator sending the trains to the manufacturer, and we did the dump right before and right after the train was sent to them. So we could see like what they changed. Yeah. Microphone phone four. 
Are you uh, implying that these idiots hooked up a CAN bus transceiver to the internet and to the train uh, controls? Maybe. Uh, there so, is, no, it's, to, to be a bit more precise, it's, 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 it's a bit more complicated because there's the UDP to CAN converter box. I mean, it's UDP to Modbus RTU and CAN. And the CAN, the CAN side of it is connected to one of the CAN networks. And the UDP side is connected to a local telematics network for the passenger information system. And that passenger information system telematics network also has a GSM modem on it. Yeah, but for sure it, it wasn't just like an open internet that anyone can send it. There's probably some VPN or something like that. But that's something we plan to analyze in upcoming months. So maybe there will be an update presentation someday. <laughs> Yoo Then the next question from the internet. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that there were some software updates um, a few days before the trains got sent into service. Um, how did those updates get there? Um, do they actually have 24-7 access to the trains, or was this done remotely? As far as I know, they, they had, I th before this whole thing got more public, they, they got uh, access to the trains. But my, my understanding is that there's like shared workshops between a lot yeah, of these companies. Yeah, so sometimes they, they just have for like shared workshop or some free access, like when they request access, the, at least that was in the past. Now it, it surprisingly changed. <laughs> <laughs> then the microphone one, please. Um, it's the 27th of December. Did you travel here by train? <laughs> I didn't. Unfortunately, there isn't good train service. I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Microphone two. Uh, so my question would be about the, I'll call it, uh, orange box, the automator, autometer thing uh, with a weird year like 2037. Was that thing affected by the year uh, 2038 bug? <laughs> would the train actually run isn't again after a year? Isn't that the box that you're supposed to send back to the manufacturer every so often to get it fixed, otherwise it breaks like that? Or is that a different uh, box? We, we heard some rumors, but that, that's not confirmed. We, we just heard rumors that those particular red box had a bug with dates, and it's, it wasn't the only case. It's probably just back in the code. Some integer overflow somewhere or something like that. But the, we don't have uh, yeah. any like, more concrete data. Then the next question from the internet. Uh, yeah, the internet wants to know if you actually found any um, legitimate locking mechanisms. So, for example, if there's something like, I don't know, battery damage or whatever, and that prevents the train from starting, or is it just um, workarounds? Yeah, the, like... Uh, yeah, for example, uh, the, uh, if, the if there's a firmware mismatch between the inverters and the PLC, I think it's a legit thing to, like, block the train because, like, the... PLC software is written in a very particular version of the firmware, so that's a safety reason to like not run against it. However, this fed into the same mechanism of just like silently stopping the train. I would have expected all of this to just like have a documented behavior. Same for things like replacing some of the parts. Like I could argue, okay, this needs to be done, uh, you know, not have hazardly, so this should be like explicitly resynchronized afterwards, but no docs. So. Even if we argue that some of those checks were legit, and I think some of them we could actually call legit, the way they, they manifested was sketchy. Yeah, and th th there were more, more checks we skipped which were like, very legit, like testing the brakes and stuff like that. Or if doors are closed. So we, ha we had a theory that it started with like, a legitimate system for stopping the train if something is wrong, but then they started adding more conditions to it which were less legitimate. <laughs> yeah, then... Uh, Microphone number one, please. Um, you said that you're only using functions the train manufacturer provided. Uh, does that mean the firmware running on those trains has remained unchanged? Yes, we have not changed any of the code. And that's the reason some of the trains we analyzed we couldn't unlock. For example, the one with the, comp uh, the compressor failure. It was, uh, there was a key, me like key cheat code to unlock it, but it was bugged. And if you power cycle the train, it will break again. Yep, we are very so. careful because uh, altering, in our understanding, altering CPU firmware would require a new certification of that train to be allowed to run on the public tracks. But yep, so that we didn't touch, manufacturer did. But. <laughs> <laughs> then microphone number two, please. 
Yeah, so I've got a question about the origins of all of this. Uh, I don't know about uh, train maintenance, but I know in car maintenance they look at fault codes and they look at OBD data and stuff like that. I'd imagine it to be uh, the same or similar with trains. Um, how did SPS get so suspicious that they reached out to Polish hackers that they needed to Google that because normally they've got helplines, service stocks, whatever. What made them uh, jump to this? Well, you have to understand that SPS and NEVAC might have some conflicts of interest in helping each other. So there might not be a way to just call NEVAC and ask you, oh, what's up? If the f next thing that NEVAC says, oh, you messed with our security system. So like kind of any sort of, you know, hoping to call someone and get this resolved area kind of wasn't, was dead on arrival for them. Yeah, and the manufacturer wasn't really helpful, and as as you've seen, it almost ended up like uh, manufacturer taking over the tender. Yeah, and in in terms of like debug codes and debug utilities, there we there is some utility, some very limited diagnostics utility. Yeah, but it, it does it doesn't show the the locks. Yeah, so it's not very useful for us. Thank you. Okay, then microphone number four. Uh, have you looked at if there are any valid safety logs which re log and report an error compared to the ones you described which just silently fail? Plenty of error codes. Like, for example, even with the compressor failure, like it would simulate an actual failure by not running the compressor, and then another subsystem would report, oh, there's no pressure, so something probably went wrong. And all of these have actual effects on the HMI that are, you know, understandable by humans. So these exist, like there's nothing that should have prevented this from also being a human readable error code. Instead it was the silent failure mode of like, don't report anything is wrong. Yep. The, the then train microphone was actually, number one please. The, the train was actually saying ready to start. Yeah, ready to start. But it didn't. Then ready to start for microphone one. Yes, yeah, so after your story got a bit of news coverage, did any other train operators reach out to you already, maybe even from Germany, about some dodgy train behavior? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I have to laugh. Um, uh, uh, microphone First, number two, please. Perfect. Um, hi. At first, thank you for the nice talk. It was very delightful just to watch you talk about it. Um, did you at any point in this whole journey of unlocking the train regret the decision to accept it? Well, that's a very good question. Um, personally, I've been a bit... Like, there you know, was this one day before deadline where nothing was working. Yeah. <laughs> so there's that part. For me personally, just even... Like, this is probably going to go forever for a long time. It's going to be in the media for a while. It's going to get political. So there's always like, maybe we shouldn't have gone public with it. But at the end of the day, that's the correct thing to do. <laughs> and yeah, it, it, like, when, when it was like one day before the deadline, my two friends here were like crunching really hard. It was a 24-hour yeah. shift system. To discover this. So we, we actually forgot to tell, tell this uh, trivia in the story. We managed to unlock the first train 43 minutes before the, the train operator arrived to cancel the contract. So it was really, really tough. Um, microphone two, please. Uh, uh, Am I microphone too? Yeah. Oh, so oh yeah, that's everything, thank you. Uh, perfect, uh, microphone one. Hi, you did mention that uh, you have to get the train recertified when you change the firmware, but uh, doesn't that need to be certified when they change the uh, date range to 20 days, or is the software uh -huh. obscure for the certifier? It, it sounds suspicious, no? That they just can update the firmware like that without re recertifying, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, 
Well, that's, part the, the, that's part of the law that we like not 100% confident yeah, I, I to comment the, the on. I think the law isn't exactly uh, clean on this. It, I think it says that if the change is significant or something like that. So it's, I, I don't know, th this is something more for a trained lawyer. On the other so. hand, the, the change was made and it was not mentioned in any paperwork from that service. Yeah, of course they didn't mention that they updated the locking mechanism. So or even update that they updated the software, right? That wasn't yeah, logged in anywhere. Some, in some cases, the train operators didn't even know that the software was changed. But is the software obscurified to the certifier? That's another good question. Uh, we don't know. Okay. Um, microphone number three. Um, you mentioned that the code is executed at every tick or something. Um, does this mean that the uh, kill switch conditions are also evaluated every now and then or only at the startup? So like if the train during operation reaches the one million kilometers, <laughs> did, uh, would it emergency break or something? That's so, another very good question. Yes. So, Okay. I can tell. Uh, the condition for one million kilometer, kilometers was in the same train that had the secondary compressor problem. So it would just disable the secondary compressor that is not needed in a normal train run, just to bring it up from a cold and dark state. Yeah, normally when, when the train was running, you had pressure in the main pressure tank. But so what about the other trigger mechanisms and trigger yeah, conditions? Yeah, and the, the other mechanism, like standing in place, uh, had more checks to ensure that it didn't it won't engage when the train is running. Uh, then, Signal Angel, the next question from the internet. Uh, yeah, the internet wanted to know if that train manufacturer actually sells elsewhere besides Poland. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then, microphone number two. Uh, yes. Uh, besides this uh, sheet code, did you find any other uh, uh, delightful uh, Easter eggs or uh, any, uh, anything of that sort in the code? Mm, not really. Nothing immediately comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the best Easter egg was just the date checking. Yeah. Because we now ha are observing twice per year the International Compressor Failure Day. <laughs> Then microphone number four. Uh, hi, you mentioned that the cheat code wasn't the Konami code. Are you able to reveal what it actually was and if it was documented anywhere? It was not documented. It was very simple. We're not yeah. revealing the particular code because we're afraid of people like just randomly pressing the buttons in the cabin because there was more than one code, like every trigger mechanisms. Yeah, would yeah. You, you could do different stuff with trains with the codes and we don't want to hint people about the pattern, how the code looks look like. So they won't start randomly experimenting. And they, they also differed between some trains. So better not experiment with them. We always like check the code and only then we use them. But it's like something that you could press with two hands within seconds. It's not like you have to sit there and like type in something with binary code. It was uh, a very quick combination. All right, thanks. Then the next question uh, from the internet. Yeah, the internet wants to know what was or is the um, relation between you and SPS and if you got anything from it, like besides publicity and maybe free rides in trains? <laughs> Good question. We should have declared our possible conflicts of interest. We were contracted to do this. We were paid. Money changed hands. Uh, yeah, we were basically paid to analyze and unlock the trains, although not for publishing this. We just yes. got like a green light. If you want, you, c you can make it public. But the, the workshop was interested mostly in checking why the trains broke and just providing a, a technical report describing what happened. Then Microsome 3. Hello. Uh, given the ramifications, are you concerned about any reprisals, be they political or otherwise? And hello from Ben. <laughs> Hi, Ben. Uh, I mean, we are mostly worried about just being dragged through courts forever. Uh, that's it, because that's like the easiest way to just annoy us. 
Uh, I don't want to give Nevak lawyers any ideas, but oops, too late, I guess. <laughs> Otherwise, no, we are, we are like 100% sure of, of that we are in the right. We're 100% sure we're acting in the public interest. It's Nevak that should be scared, not us. And we are 100%. Additionally, we are 100% certain of our findings presented here. Yeah. So unless they start sending ninja squads our way, I think we're safe. <laughs> Microsoft number one. Is there any chance that Nevag uh, is going to get her hands on those trains and would try to destroy evidence or do something like that? Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, if, if there is any chance that Nevag will get their hands on those trains, which were like... Uh, with those locks and we'll try to uh, update and destroy that evidence, like update firmware, removing yeah, those yeah. locks. Yeah, we, we are prepared for that. We have done dumps already. Some of them are audited by big four companies. So even if they try to, like the worst thing they can do now is start try to hide the evidence because I don't think the court is going to like that. <laughs> yeah, we are running out of time, uh, which means uh, you can reach uh, here uh, all the colleagues, Redford. QCK. And Mr. Tick.